Hello, bonjour, no hoy. I'm Roger Hilton, media presenter at Globesec, and I am thrilled to be christening the inaugural episode of Globecast. Direct from Bratislava, every second week, Globecast and its special guests will be discussing the most newsworthy issues focused on foreign affairs, international security, economics, CEE, and culture. This week, we are kicking off the first episode with the true Slovak titan. In studio with us right now is Ivan Miklos, former Slovak deputy prime minister and minister of finance. In addition to his multiple accomplishments, including guiding Slovakia into the Eurozone, he's also a member of the Globsec International Advisory Council and current advisor to the Prime Minister of Moldova. Minister Miklos, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Minister Miklos, you're joining us here on Monday. It's raining outside. We have a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Your insight couldn't be timelier as both Europe and CEE lurch into troubled economic waters. Can you set the stage for our listeners and give your take on the current economic landscape at the moment? Yeah, I think current economic situation is uh, difficult everywhere. Uh, This is mostly caused by higher inflation, which we are facing in all all world. Uh, it was worse, even worsening by energy crisis. And one of the big reasons of this energy crisis, and not only energy crisis, also food increase crisis, is war in Ukraine, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine, which means in this regard, it's a really, really difficult and very challenging situation, especially because we are just now um, before before winter season which means uh, now there, there is necessity to prepare very quickly on the national level as well on, on the European level, a special measures for facing this, because really uh, energy prices, electricity, gas prices are in such high that it can really threat not only people, especially vulnerable people, but also a significant part of the economy. There are many companies which, if nothing is done, will be not able to continue in production, which is, of course, connected then with unemployment and other other, other economic and social problems. And finally, also political problems, of course, because this big threat of the inflation, instability, bankruptcy, is uh, creating also political tensions and political problems as well. Well, Minister Miklos, you've outlined a lot of moving pieces, and I just wanted to remind all of our listeners out there that these are just some of the major issues that we'll be tackling at the 11th edition of the Tatra Summit, Globesec's flagship conference on all things economic, finance, sustainability. Minister Miklos, you touched on it already when it comes to high energy prices and the electricity. Last week, there was a State of the European Union which took place where they outlined uh, a reform of the electricity market reform that looks to raise 140 billion euros. What's your assessment of this policy? Is the EU ever overstepping or are they actually showing leadership? No, it is definitely not overstepping. The situation is really, really difficult and exceptional, I have to say. I see analogy, you know, when the uh, global financial crisis hit in uh, 2008, it was necessary to make uh, really, really exceptional measures. At the, that time, for instance, to... Uh, to 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 put a lot of money to the system to avoid freezing of the assets in the in the financial sector. Today is uh, situation is similar, not the same but similar because it is about energy. Today's or last week's energy prices are really really artificial. We cannot say that it is market if it is uh, jumping multiply multiply up, which means this exceptional situation is uh, uh, a. a pr- is approving the the exceptional measures and ex- exceptional policy measures. And this regard, for instance, capping the the price of of energy is, I think, something what is necessary. And also taking money from those producers who have uh, extra profit because they are producing uh, electricity with much lower. Uh, costs uh, as it is the highest cost what is necessary for the electricity market. In this regard, it's necessary to understand that the electricity market has some specifics because it is very difficult and almost impossible in in big scale to have storage of the the electricity. Then it is necessary to accept the highest uh, price of the of the, the most costly producers which are producing necessity of the of the necessary amount of the of the energy, which means in this exceptional situation, it is really 
uh, necessary also to, to, to make exceptional measures. One problem is that, uh, of course, the best is if it will be on the European level, if it will be common uh, measures. One problem is that some countries already prepared and implemented their own measures on the national level, which means now it is very complicated, not only technically what to do, but how to coordinate this. Uh, but I think now, at least at least now, we can see that uh, European Union and, 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 and the states, EU member states, are trying to do everything necessary as soon as possible. I mean, Mr. Miklos, I want to go back to the word you said, which was exceptional measures. Do you foresee any more exceptional measures the EU might have to take to get the economic situation under control, whether it's in CEE on more of a continental level? Yeah, of course, The what is what was already announced is the cap for the for the price and then 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 some extra windfall uh, taxation from those who have extra profit and then redistributing this uh, money to um, companies uh, most affected companies but also to vulnerable people and of course it will be the combination of the of the uh, european common common level measures and individual national uh, measures and of course then there are also some other possible uh, combination what one is connected uh, of the of the measures one is connected with the social policy how to help uh, those who are the most affected then you have one possibility to 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 help only those who are really the most vulnerable but it is difficult some some sometimes to identify who is really who is not another possibility is some some countries are doing is that they are giving money to everybody because it is more expensive but much easier and you don't have risk that somebody who really needs the help will not receive this help then this another possibility is to reduce uh, some taxes especially value added tax which for for energy some countries are 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 doing this what is clear, at least in the economy, is that the best uh, way is the the worst the worst possible way is to have administrative regulation of prices. Uh, one last thing, just to pick up on, I mean, are you at all a bit nervous about the growing debt? As a lot of countries have just exited the pandemic and had a lot of intervention, do you think it's too much money that's floating around, or do you think these measures, as you said, about giving everybody a one shot tax break or a one shot uh, delivery of cash, is really the right move right now? I'm afraid from the from the level of debt in general. As uh, today, if we are speaking in figures, uh, overall in debtness of the, the I mean global in debtness. I mean also both public and private debt uh, today is about 350 uh, percent of global GDP, which is unbelievably high. Just for comparison, uh, 23 years ago in 1999, it was 200 percent of GDP, which it, it is almost double. If you are speaking about uh, developed countries, today figure is 420 percent of GDP, which means now really the problem is sustainability of this of this uh, debt. But if you are speaking about current uh, energy crisis and inflation. Despite of this very high indebtedness, it is necessary to do to do something. But now we can see. But then, after this specific crisis and acute crisis will be overcome, then it will be, of course, very very important how to manage the the economy on the European level or even on the global level to to reduce this indebtedness. Because problem is, and this is why today, uh, especially national banks are 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 catched in some trap because on the facing inflation, very high inflation, it is necessary to increase interest rates. But if you are increasing interest rates in this kind of high indebtedness, then if it is, you are creating, of course, threat of stagnation, recession and stagflation. And stagflation is really something very, very difficult because we, we know from history last time it was in 70s and beginning of 80s of the last century. It is not, not so far from, from here, from today. And we know how difficult it was to deal with this, how really drastic measures uh, ha, had, to be, had to be done to deal with this. And there are some opinions today that uh, we are under threat of another a stagflation period uh, now. And this is, if it will come, then it will be really, really difficult.
Well, Minister Miklos, you kind of stole my my thunder there a little bit. And I want to, you know, we've talked about some of the specific issues on tax, on debt, and some of the issues on, on the policy level. But earlier, uh, you had an article that you put forth in Danique where you argued two different views of where the global economy is going. You mentioned it a little bit now with stagflation, but can you maybe elaborate for all of our international audience, what are the two views that are out there right now and what you see as the most probable outcome? Yeah. Uh, still majority of experts, economists, analysts, uh, Wall Street uh, financial institutions still think that uh, today's uh, problem is only temporary and after energy crisis war in uh, uh, Russian war against Ukraine, it will be possible to manage the situation and to reduce uh, inflation without threat of stagflation. But there are also opinions which are which are saying that not, which are saying that the current energy crisis is just uh, just beginning of the much more serious problems and much more serious global crisis. One of of authors who are arguing uh, like that is Nuriel Rubini. I think it is it is uh, important to hear Rubini also because he was one of the few economists who correctly predicted global financial crisis, which hit in full scale in 2008. In uh, summer 2006, at the IMF meeting, he warned that uh, it will be global crisis, global financial crisis, which will start in the US and then it will be uh, also also going to all over the over the world, which means that's the that's the reason why it is worth to, to speak, uh, to, to hear uh, this kind of people. And what is saying Rubini now, and he had during summer, he had more articles in international uh, press where he is arguing that there are very strong signals that uh, just now high inflation and energy crisis is just beginning of the much more serious stagflation period. And not only stagflation period, but a uh, stagflation period uh, connected with the debt crisis. And he is saying that when in the 70s and 80s we had stagflation, but with at the same time very low, relatively low, low level of indebtedness, then in uh, 2008, 2009, we had debt crisis and financial crisis, but without stagflation. Now he is uh, arguing that what is a real threat is that we will have both, which means also stagflation like in 70s and also debt crisis like in 2008-2009. Uh, and reason for this, what he is arguing is that the reasons for this problematic period is that we have problems on both sides, supply side and also demand side crisis. Supply side, especially because um, so-called deglobalization. One of the most important factor or reason behind very low inflation and relatively high growth from the mid-80s till 2008, 2009, was globalization, the breakdown of communism, opening China, which means global economy was delivered by cheap raw material, cheap labor, mm -hmm new possibilities to produce uh, goods and services very cheaply, like in China, for instance, and so on, so on. And the most important trend at that time was offshoring, which means the most important factor or criteria for localization of the, of the production was the lowest possible costs. But now we have a deglobalization because growth of protectionism, isolationism, uh, the economic populism and political populism, then also new geopolitical situation, which means now we can see not the offshore, uh, uh, offshoring trends, but reshoring, which means returning production to, to, to home, or nearshoring, which means despite uh, more expensive production, uh, preferential to, to product in, in closer countries, or friendshoring, to remove the production or services to, 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 to countries who are ally, politically and geopolitically, and so on, so on. Then another problem, which is growing costs and then fueling inflation, is uh, climate changes, of course, because uh, the, it was 
under investment to the fossil uh, fuel and it was not uh, replaced uh, by enough investment in the renewable, for instance. And this is one of the reasons also were in uh, Russian war, but not only. Also these kind of um, trends, which are longer term, are fueling also higher higher uh, prices, which means all this trend on the supply side are fueling the inflation. And then you have uh, also demand side problem and demand side problem is connected with this expansion uh, policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, policy indebtedness and so on and so on. Till, till now, this uh, expansion monetary and fiscal policy was reflecting mostly only in the prices of real assets and uh, and and shares for instance yeah on the capital market but now from the pandemic pandemic was another event which increased these bailouts and and pumping money to the economy and now we see that these effects of the supply side reasons and of course also disruption of the of the chains uh global global uh, chains uh, it is it effect of this is much higher inflation and as when when it hit it hit uh, one and a half year ago this inflation growth at that time also majority of economies expected that it will be just short term because it was kind of consumption which was removed uh, from the from the pandemic time when economies have been closed but we see now that we are one and a half year from then and still uh, still inflation is growing. Well, yeah. Oh, Minister Miklos, I mean, as you said, you've already outlined the supply and demand side of the issue that Rubini calls for. And as you said, for everybody who didn't read the article, Rubini really puts <laughs> forward, you know, comprehensive arguments on both the policy side and the political side, which Minister Miklos mentioned. One thing I just wanted to get your take on, Minister Miklos, is Rubini calls all of this the balkanization of the global economy, which is strongly st- uh, stagflationary and also linked to the rapid aging of the population, not only in rich countries, but also in a growing number of developing countries such as China. Can you just maybe break down for us what you see as actually meaning the balkanization of the global economy? And is that a, a term that we'll, we'll be hearing much more frequently? Yeah, I think Rubini means uh, balkanization uh, as uh, deglobalization, which means it is a kind of effect of politics uh, in, uh, in, in disruption of the, of the global, uh, global uh, supply chains uh, and and change from this as as we said offshoring when the most important and only criteria was diminishing of the costs and accepting other criteria which are which are more and more uh, important in this regard it is not only it is we didn't mention everything uh, cyber uh, cyber cyber mm-hmm. security is another one for instance which means now cyber terrorism can uh, really destroy your production or if you don't want to be destroyed, you have to spend a lot of money for for defense against uh, cybersecurity, which means it is either reduction, uh, if, if, uh, if these attacks are successful, it is reducing your output, which means causing, uh, causing stagnation. If you don't want to, to, to have these consequences, you have to invest a lot of, which is increasing your prices. Which means you can see on this small example of cybersecurity, how it is stagflationary. Yes. At the same time. Yeah, you have mentioned the the aging. Aging is also a problem because because uh, elder people are more spending. Uh, and more taxing people, for the government, yeah. right? It costs more. Which for means them. which means this is also inflationary. If more money are spent, it is it is inflationary. Yeah? Then you have uh, geopolitics uh, and so on, so on. Which means now it will be surely another effect of the after Russian aggression in in Ukraine will be surely that it will increase the the expenditures on defense in in many countries, and everything this is stagflationary. Yeah. But if we look to the future, then, as we said, you outline in the article where some of the major places on Wall Street, Goldman and Sachs, they don't necessarily take the the position of Rubini. But where do you fall on this, Minister Miklos? Do you think we are heading towards the stagflation or it's a little bit too early to say right now? Yeah. Important is that nobody knows. Nobody knows. If anybody is telling now that he knows what will happen, I think this is uh, this is not not serious and this is this is, this is incorrect. Um, because also, you know, Rubini uh, was 
correct at that time in 2006 when he predicted, but then he had also some other predictions which haven't been fulfilled, <laughs> uh, which means it is really difficult, difficult, Bit of a crap shoot. difficult to say. My personal personal position is that I'm, let's say I'm not so optimistic as majority of Wall Street institutions and, and their economists and experts, but uh, we will see. We will see. Uh, one one important reason is that what 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 are arguing or what are the arguments uh, of those who are against this pessimistic is that uh, labor market is doing very well, which means it is not showing kind of a signal of a recession. Even it is shortage of, of of labor force in the US in other markets, unemployment rate is is record low. Uh, another is that yes, still we have an argument behind these more optimistic opinions. Is that yes, yes, we have very high, still very high inflation, but it is caused by war, which was impossible to predict, and war hopefully will be not long term. Hopefully, uh, Russian war will be will be finished in, uh, unfortunately, not in weeks, but hopefully in in months, maybe a few few not not longer than few few years, which means. Uh, I, I really don't have some kind of strict uh, position in this in this regard, but I'm because you know finally this indebtedness, as I have mentioned, also figures is really huge, mm -hmm. and this is really kind of trap. How to how to uh, manage uh, this indebtedness? Well, I think like you, Minister Miklos, you know everybody on the policy side is still trying to work through this economic puzzle because as Minister Miklos had mentioned in terms of the employment rates, just to give all of our listeners a context, in the USA, the unemployment rate now is at 3.7% and in the EU, it's at 6%, which are historical lows, right? Despite all of the other negative factors going on. Uh, Mr. Miklos, I want to get your take on one big issue that happened last week um, with Germany temporarily taking control of two subsidiaries of Rosneft. Obviously, uh, the idea, this compact between Berlin and Moscow about Wandel durch Handel, change through trade, I think is now firmly over. So again, we, we talked earlier about the state of the union in the EU. What do you think of Berlin's move to take temporary control? And do you think other EU states will do the same when it comes to energy assets? I fully support this uh, decision of the of the German government because it is clear that Gazprom and Gazprom is just a tool of the of the Kremlin is misusing its uh, energy policy, energy resources, and everything. And it was clear also from the from the spring of this this year, for instance, that uh, Russia was not fulfilling these these uh, storages, which have been either owned by Gazprom or Rosneft or have been rented, I mean long-term rented, which means it is clear that everything what they are doing now even stop the flow of the gas through Nord Stream 1 is not uh, based on technological or economic or on, updates, on reason, yeah. but it is, it is it's all political. Because political, political weapon, political tool for... Uh, for, for for war, for aggression, open aggression against Ukraine, but unopen, uh, hidden aggression against uh, European Union, against our values, against, against our our system, which means I fully support any uh, any measures which are which are implemented uh, by by not only German government but also other governments. Even on the contrary, I think uh, some policy is still insufficient. Especially if you are speaking about support of the Ukrainian Ukraine and Ukrainian army by by weapons, which is necessary to do even much more, and as well as uh, uh, financial support for the for the for the Ukraine. Well, it goes without saying, with so many moving pieces, there's going to be a lot of more difficult decisions for governments to take. And one big one that I need to get your opinion on is, obviously, we've already touched on the role of industry and government, but what we're seeing more so ever than right now is sort of the discontent of society and everyday citizens. For all of our listeners, there was an alarming poll in Danique that outlined how a majority of Slovaks, over 50%, want Russia to defeat Ukraine. And just this weekend across the border in Austria, protesters in Vienna decried high living costs, demanding higher salaries and bigger pensions. So, Minister Miklos, you're a deputy prime minister. You know, you have a bit of a, the pulse of the country. My question to you now is, against the backdrop of this growing discontent in Europe, what options are available for governments to address these economic hardships between the intersection of a hot war and all of the problems they're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis? 
Yeah, this is a very difficult question, of course. And as you have mentioned by these public opinion polls, that more Slovaks support or uh, want to 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 victory of 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 Russia as victory of of uh, Ukraine, I was really shocked. And I think this is something which is unbelievable and, and unacceptable. Maybe because there are now disputes if this uh, public opinion polls was correct, if it was understood the question. But I think does, it doesn't matter in principle because even if it is not not close majority, even if it is close minority, it is alarming, uh, this kind of, 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 of opinion. Um, Especially against all of the military aid that Slovakia has been providing and humanitarian yeah, no, yeah, aid. Yeah, because because finally the position of Slovakian government is correct and is uh, fully uh, ingestible, but unfortunately, population is polarized and it is significant part of population which is which doesn't like the system system of uh, democracy and and market economy maybe they feel themselves to exclude it from the from the system and so on. but it is it is really alarming if a majority of people or let's say significant part of society is supporting aggressor aggressor who is killing innocent people aggressor who without any reason uh, attacked the the country our neighboring country the aggressor who is openly saying that we are the other on the row if if he will be successful in in Ukraine this is really really alarming and f- but but can and also you know you said that protests in Austria for instance against the cost of living and so on so on. but it is caused not by Ukrainians it is caused by Russia by <laughs> Russian aggression because war is because Russia Putin's regime attacked Ukraine and because war we have higher prices also of the But obviously President Putin is hoping to squeeze the populations and not you know for those people not to see the argument yeah, yeah, that yeah. they cause if that when they go to the Potravini and it's more expensive and, and that's the reason why it is necessary to 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 take some exceptional measures now also despite of this high indebtedness which we have in our shoulders which means on one side, it is necessary to overcome the situation because this winter will be key in this regard and to help people and to help companies. But on the other side, it is also first to be much more effective in communication to explain people what are the reasons. And, and third, what is really necessary is fight much more effectively and aggressively, let's say, against Russian propaganda, including Russian trolls and Russian people who are paid by this aggressor. Uh, who are who are spreading this this and then another question which is very legitimate is what to how to manage and how to control and how to uh, the the social networks which are very detrimental also in this in this regard which means uh, you know for for freedom and for democracy it is necessary to fight because if not they, it it will be then 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 enemies of freedom and enemies of of democracy will win. Well, obviously, it goes without saying the issues you've mentioned about pushing back against propaganda and online presence. I mean, that's a 24-hour, 365 uh, job that the EU is doing, but you can never really evaporate it. You can only contain it. Mr. Miklos, the last question I just had for you, if we reduce all of what we've talked about right now, is it as simple as saying is that if the EU can make it through winter and get to the spring of 2023, that everything will return to normal more or less? Or do you think that the protests will carry on once the heating season is over? Unfortunately, it will be not so easy. First, if you are speaking about winter, there will be two difficult winters, not just one. Because what will be problem in spring, hopefully we will overcome this spring, but then the storages will be empty and it will be necessary to prepare for at least another uh, winter, which means uh, the most difficult will be this winter, but also second winter will be not, not easy. This is the first. Another problem is that, yes, hopefully energy crisis will be overcome, but still, we will have another problems. I, we have mentioned uh, many times today indebtedness. Indebtedness will not disappear. On the contrary, if we need money now for these extra measures uh, for the overcoming energy crisis, it seems to be that uh, indebtedness will be even increased in the next, mm-hmm. let's say, one year. Yeah. Then we have, of course, problem with competitiveness of uh, Europe, European economy, especially difference between South and North. And it is connected with sustainability of Euro as uh, common common currency, which means 
there are a lot of a lot of challenges in front of national countries in front of EU as well it is clear now that in EU it will be necessary to change rules also to strengthen some policies on the on on the, on the on the on the european level at least security at least foreign affairs energy energy policy which means that there are a lot of a lot of problems and challenges which are in front in front of us and they will not disappear by solving uh, energy crisis. Well, it might not have been the decision or the answer we all wanted, but it's good to know that you see this being a long-term issue and that just because we get through the spring of 2023, it will all go away. Uh, for all of our listeners out there, just to let you know that at the moment of the recording, the EU's gas storage is at 85% filled. Um, as, as Minister Miklo said, that will be good for this winter, but for the next one. But as diversification goes on, there'll yeah. be other issues. And of course, with the RE... Uh, excuse me, the R, yeah, RE Power EU plan. We'll see what the next thing is. Um, for our international audience, we're going to end on something a little bit lighter. So, Minister Miklos, you're from the east of Slovakia. Um, for everybody who's listening who hasn't been to Bratislava or Slovakia, you know, if you were a tourist or, you know, what is the first thing you would counsel somebody to do when visiting Slovakia? Yeah, yeah, as you said, I'm from eastern Slovakia. Usually, tourists are coming to Bratislava and to High Tatras, but we have, of course, also many other very nice places. For those who love nature, Slovakia has really, really nice nature and mountains, not only High Tatras, Low Tatras, other mountains. Slovakia is one of the most forest uh, country in Europe, as I have read somewhere that the second most forest country uh, after Finland. And Slovakia is, for, for instance, also a lot of uh, castles. Most castles per GDP uh, yeah, or per capita maybe. in the entire world, actually. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I just just recently I I visited uh, Castle Bojnice, which is a beautiful castle, maybe maybe the most beautiful castle in 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 Slovakia, which means I fully uh, recommend this. And they have a lot of good spa as well, which is also, which means you can you can join and connect also health. Uh, uh, goals uh, and then nature, then history and, and other. And some great food, right? Uh, uh, and great food as well, yeah. Excellent. Well, Minister Miklos, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, uh, Adam Siposh will be back next week for the next episode talking on the Tatra Summit, Innovation Potential and CEE and the release of the Danube Tech Valley Initiative and the updates. Uh, and our next English recording will take place the week of September 6th. So again, Minister Miklos, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all of our listeners. And until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Bye.